All right, welcome to episode 23 of Digitales. My name is Fazan Sayed, and today with me I have my guest, the chairman of the Pakistan Stock Exchange and the CEO of Cyan Capital, dear friend Suleiman Mehdi. How are you, Suleiman? How are you doing I'm today? I'm good. Thank you for having me over. Thanks for joining us. So you're basically on the capital market side. You've seen businesses grow in Pakistan. You know the landscape really well. I want to kick this discussion off with, do you see potential for businesses flourishing over the next couple of years in Pakistan? Uh, yes, and a big yes. And I'll uh, give you certain anecdotal. So, you know, if you kind of uh, uh, look at the overall business environment today, pre-COVID, then phase one, and then you break it out into phase two. So probably Pakistan has done very well in terms of, you know, of course, there are certain natural given synergies like, you know, 60% of the population is less than 30 years of age. Somehow our eating habits have led us to a strong immune system that we have. And now if you look around the region, so businesses are shut. Uh, but in Pakistan, life is still as per normal, which does not mean that you don't need to be careful. I've been talking to larger textile players over the last one week or so. And uh, one answer that I get from all of them is that till June 21, we are all packed. They're looking for wow. outsourced labor to meet up the demands, to meet up their order books. So I think this is something that is very exciting. Another interesting bit, you know, if you look at the last five months remittances coming into the system, so it's a it's a function that we are having additional 200 300 million dollars so it's been five months consecutively north of 2.2 billion dollars this <laughs> 200 300 million dollar is a function of social suspension in the regional areas so the clubs are closed all the entertainment areas are closed outside of the world in the region and hence that social spend is now being converted into savings and coming back into Pakistan. So I see a very exciting future for the businesses in Pakistan in the days to come. And especially, there is a very large opportunity for all import substitution business today to come up, put plants, and produce quality producers for export and for local consumption. So you're talking about this additional liquidity coming into Pakistan, you know, to the form of remittances. And you're talking about, let's say, the textile sector doing well. Is textile the only sector that's doing well? I mean, textiles has been sort of the, the baby of Pakistan, has always sort of been protected in a certain way. And it's managed to, uh, you know, sort of survive difficult times. You know, are we giving it too much protection? Is that the issue here? Uh, you know, honestly speaking, the textile sector has always faced one challenge when we are talking about exports of Pakistan, and that has been the cost of energy in the region. So if you look at the energy tariffs around, you know, our neighbors, especially our competitors like Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, if you, if you kind of look at these countries which are competing with us on, on all textile segments, their cost of energy has always been very low. Our cost of energy has always been very high. So despite that, you know, disadvantage today, uh, which has been there, I think uh, textile sector has been a very resilient sector. Why are we talking about textiles today out of your total exports of something like 24, 25 billion dollars, 50 percent comprises of textiles. So definitely it is an important sector. But there is a upside here. And that is that you we just can't continue relying on textiles only. We really need to look at the exports. We really need to have some out of solution things, look at other commodities, other areas. So your, you know, your dependence goes a little down on the textiles and then you can balance out on your overall export. So of course we should not be kind of hundred percent be dependent on textiles. And that has been the case so far. And is there anything the government should be doing at this point to assist new industries, be it food processing, uh, you know, be it anything else? You know, what can the government do to assist those industries to develop so we reduce our dependency on just one sector? So, A, I think uh, uh, the best thing that the government can do today uh, to promote exports is uh, to kind of provide 
defined long term policies for all the sectors it's very unfortunate that there is a lot of uncertainty in terms of uh, any sector that we have to pick at times there are gdcs being imposed gidc being imposed on fertilizers textiles and then there are situations that you know there is some settlement with on the gidc front so one best thing that the government can do today is to provide define concrete policies for the next 10 15 20 years of course there can be flexibility to review them with the changing environment but we need to have consistent policies for all businesses to grow and especially to promote the exports from pakistan so i think and consistency and in policy making is something that parliament should be doing or should it be coming from some of the advisors that are in place right now so a uh, what i find as a disconnect uh, right now is that Uh, globally uh, you see whenever a a certain sector policy is being developed or you know uh, a certain framework is being developed uh, 80 to 90% participation for that specific policy comes from the relevant businessmen the entrepreneurs i think the only thing that is missing here is that even today in pakistan many of these policies are being developed in isolation in a certain boardroom in islamabad so mm-hmm. as long as you don't bring on those relevant business groups and entrepreneurs who are into the business hands on it's extremely very very difficult to kind of uh, get the right policies in place so one has to rope in the business community the relevant players in that business to develop these policies and to do that whose responsibility is it in your opinion of course i think the uh, the present government the government in vogue uh, has the owners of the economy uh, they should be uh, promoting all future policies and decision makings uh, in complete collaboration with the relevant uh, players of the business and in, when you talk about policy one of the areas that uh, pakistan is very behind is around bankruptcy laws you know for effective businesses to be built uh, you know to be able to provide protection um the us has a very well structured uh, set of bankruptcy laws different parts of the world have the same do you think we are ready for those in pakistan do you think they'll be important as we try to develop a business and entrepreneurial uh, economy yeah so this is something you know very close to my heart and i have been uh, kind of preaching this uh, at many different forums so uh, first the banking industry also needs to take this leap frog and promote and support a foreclosure laws in the country just to give you an example uh today if you look at the overall housing finance or the mortgage finance industry in pakistan it's it's just negligible it's not there and and one of the prime reason is also now i'm talking from the banking perspective is that they don't have the foreclosure laws right so mm-hmm. for example if someone goes out and leases out a piece of land and then he mortgages it with the bank to get some refinancing on it uh, the banks are really kind of concern as to you know what right would they have in case of a default because here the court cases would last for the next 10 15 20 years and by that time the bank will continue providing provisionings into their balance sheets right so this is one side of it the biggest important factor for foreclosure laws is that uh, the banking industry also needs to understand the distinction or the difference between personal assets and business assets so even today unfortunately uh, banking industry in pakistan is all about brick and mortars so if you really want financing you really need to go provide some kind of property or some asset some factory premises to get financing i think uh, i've seen many entrepreneurs in my life who have mortgaged their own personal properties their father's property to raise capital in form of loans to promote their businesses here i think that you know uh, the banking industry on the whole needs to be clear in their mind that there is a difference between the personal asset and the business asset and you can't actually tag both the assets in the line of any business so yes i think um, there's been some uh, great uh, initiatives those have been taken by the central bank during the covid uh, uh, phase 1 and those those initiatives are actually yielding results that we see the banking industry is growing the industry on the whole the manufacturing sector is growing plus uh, one scheme that was very interesting was a 
a subsidized loan at 2.99%, 3% if you don't fire anybody, right? So they've taken some great initiative. We have a very dynamic governor, state bank in place. I think uh, with him, we can expect the foreclosure laws also to come into force uh, very soon, hopefully. But, but a lot of these things that you talk about happened because COVID happened. Had COVID not happened, we were on a very different path following an IMF uh, mandated program that had the interest rates north of like, I mean, double, I mean, mid double digits roughly, right? I mean, only because of COVID did the financing thing happen, only because of COVID did your interest rates go down. So it's, do you really attribute this success and this liquidity to the government or is it because they were stuck with a situation in which they didn't know what to do? So, okay, so one has to understand a little bit background about these IMF programs, right? So a, it's it's a very extensive document that we would you know as an outsider we would not understand the kind of limitations you have once you were getting into the extended fund facility, right? So there were some severe restrictions. There were some very stringent policy guidelines in terms of uh, rupee dollar parity, in terms of your interest rates going up. Our current account deficit situation were at the worst when they took charge. So having said that, yes. Uh, COVID did play a very integral role in bringing the interest rate down. And hence, you can see so much of an economic activity at, um, at all the sectors, right? But then again, COVID led to those relaxations from the IMF. And that was very, very important because if it would not have been COVID in an ideal situation, maybe we would have been at a 10% or 11% interest rate as of today. So yes, it's been a blessing in disguise, but they were very, very proactive. So, you know, I think within what, uh, less than six months, interest rates were down by 620 <coughs> basis points. So that's also kind of very, uh, you know, uh, unique. So they've taken some very, very uh, good decisions in very challenging times. So we must give them credit for that, of course. With, without COVID, those restrictions would have still been in place with the IMF program going on. Uh, but uh, I would not take away credit from them in terms of, you know, them being very proactive and introducing all the right kind of policies for supporting businesses under complete lockdown situation. No, and you're absolutely right. And I think you have to credit the government in terms of moving quickly, supporting the sort of the entrepreneurs, be it large or small. I mean, I can tell you, frankly, that we benefited uh, from the uh, you know payroll financing because it was a great option to ensure that there's continued employment and I think anyone who took advantage of this benefited from that and I think that it was quick rapid thinking on the feet of the government um, but one of the questions still remains you know you're very optimistic you're bullish you're saying there's liquidity coming in uh, sectors are doing well multinationals in Pakistan historically have not seen this as a viable market in certain sectors they've even left Exited pharma is one great example of that. Do you think that multinationals coming into Pakistan is the sign of progress? Why don't they see this as a viable market? So there are there are two parts to it, right? The first part is if you're talking about multinationals in this country, so we do have presence of the giants like of Unilevers, PNG. Uh, recently, you've seen this announcement of Cargill coming in investing. Uh, then we've got Wilmar investing, then got Friesland, Campina investing. So they look at Pakistan as a consumer economy. And, you know, we, we as a nation, we as an economy thrive on consumerism. So with a population north of 200 million, uh, food sector seems to be their priority. <clears throat> in terms to be very specific on the pharmaceutical side, we also need to bear in mind when the foreigners or the multinationals are investing in Pakistan. So they're converting their dollars and converting dollars into PKR and bringing it into the country. Now, uh, in the last two and a half years or so, we have devalued by almost 60%. It's been a journey from all the way from 100 to 175 and then now 160, 61. So this devaluation is, is a killer. And hence, I always keep on saying the best way to devalue our currency is a defined devaluation. You can devalue by one pesas every day. People would know it's going to be 3.65% a year. People can, you know, kind of do their projections, tuition fees, school fees, university fees, everything, healthcare, everything can be aligned. 
this kind of massive devaluation uh, was kind of mandatory looking at the previous five years of uh, negligible devaluation right <laughs> also not correct because if you don't devalve uh, looking at the economic parameters of the country uh, ultimately you become uncompetitive in terms of your exports right so <clears throat> there was no choice but to devalve your currency versus usd and that's how you have become competitive today i don't think pakistan would have been able to export uh, textiles worth 12 13 billion dollars if we would have still be at that 100 or 110 rupees mm -hmm. so uh, from a multinational perspective the biggest factor the biggest risk factor has been devaluation i think this is a great opportunity a great time we have already devalued by 60% for these multinational to look at pakistan favorably in the pharma sector again devaluation has been the biggest challenge uh, and just to give you an example you see there's always been an element of transfer pricing for all the multinational in the pharma space now all those multinationals those have been bought by local entrepreneurs of pakistan have grown massively so the question comes here why and how so when i say transfer pricing most of these multinationals in the pharma space are required to procure the active pharma ingredient which is called api or the raw material from their parent companies now that is where you know that api is actually priced in dollar again it becomes uncompetitive and secondly those are higher if you can you know if you're supposed to outsource the same api from either india or china so that is one classic example that multinationals in the pharma space has left the country but those who have acquired have become the giants in this business i was i thought you were going to go and talk about ethical practices in sales uh, and explain that is the reason why they grew but anyways <laughs> so what you're saying is that look multinationals not being present or you know let's say the devaluation being an issue this gives an opportunity to pakistani businesses to really sort of take hold set ground and grow then why is it that we don't see the concept of conglomerates in pakistan big business holdings at the same scale or even let's say one fifth the scale of india if let's say we're at the 200 million population there at let's say 1.2 we should be at that percentage right why are we so far behind oh okay so uh, uh you see if i just take you a little back uh, there's been a lot of uh, digression for many of the business groups in pakistan uh, of course we can't even compare them because i was just going through uh, one one uh, news article where probably this is some time back where you know one listed uh, the entire ambani group being listed at the national stock exchange and the bombay stock exchange just that group's market capitalization was equal to the entire market capitalization of the pakistan stock exchange <laughs> <laughs> so that's how big those groups have grown what is the difference i'll come back to what i had mentioned and emphasized earlier consistency in policy policies being not made in isolation policies being made in complete consultation with the business community now this is the basic difference if i have to compare today uh, where india is versus pakistan so a what is very important is consistency in policy and participation of the business community in making those policies i think india has done very well in terms of making their policies on these lines unfortunately i think in pakistan this is one area we lack and my strong recommendation that this culture should be promoted sooner the better uh secondly there's been a little digression within the business community say for example uh, <clears throat> textile players being one of the largest exporters uh, of the country so there's been digression in terms of not reinvesting into their own businesses over the last couple of years and the digression came from you know windfall gains uh, coming in from the real estate sector and that real estate sector is actually not real estate development it's actually investing into plots investing into a plot does not creates an economic activity it's a transaction between three people right the buyer the seller and the broker in between there's no job creation there's no employment creation there is no tax attached to it so there's no value addition to it but they make a ton of money yeah so that that windfall gains kicking in from the real estate investment or investments into plot 
has been one of the biggest digression from reinvesting into the businesses. I think it's very unfortunate because today when you talk to them, despite uh, whatever capacities they have enhanced, uh, they are still full for June 2021, which means that, you know, you we can't cater more orders. There, there is demand, but there is a supply issue here right now. So I think this is one of the reasons that very, very few groups, and I'm not saying all of the groups have done the same. Then there are also larger conglomerates in the country, like the Tabas, the Heather Ali, the, uh, uh, the Engros have done very well. So what they have been operating is on a philosophy of reinvesting into their own businesses. I think we really need to have this mindset back. There is a huge opportunity where the present government is very clear in terms of curbing down imports. Of course, it's a function of the large current account deficits that in 2017, 18, we were close to $20 billion in current account deficit. Now is a situation that we are in a $870 million current account surplus. Now here is an opportunity that all those products, all those imports have been curbed down. This is an opportunity for the local entrepreneurs to actually come up guns blazing and start investing into all those businesses which were import substitution. So for example, your quality cheese, dairy products, juices, you know, soft drinks, water, this just, just tremendous room in all consumer items today for these larger entrepreneurs to kind of uh, produce here locally. As I say, you know, uh, make in Pakistan, you know. So that's that's this is an opportunity for these uh, larger groups to start investing aggressively in Pakistan. So you're saying that given the current situation with import substitution and everything, the right, in your view, then the right asset class to invest in is business? I mean, based on sort of the current situation, or you still think that real estate is the, if I, if I want to create wealth, right? And at the end of the day, most people are like thinking from a very selfish standpoint, right? Yeah, I want to create personal wealth given the instability, the, the lack of consistency in leadership in our country, I need to create wealth to secure myself and my family. And therefore, there's real estate where there's a lot of uh, prospective investing that creates quick returns. Do you think that that is still the right class to invest in or should we take a longer view and say, you know what, that's really going to business or the stock market because businesses will be investing? What's the right asset class then given the current situation? So uh, I would kind of uh, uh, divide the real estate part into two again. Uh, investing into plots today is not the right thing to do, even from a returns perspective. Uh, investing into real estate development, looking at the package that has been recently announced by the prime minister, I think it, it, it's a no brainer. Right. So, you know, there are there are three different challenges in any real estate development today in Pakistan. When you go out in the market to buy a plot, there is a difference between the DC rate and the market price, right? So it becomes extremely difficult for a, a, a group or a business uh, a group to invest because, you know, day one, you're going to actually blacken out certain portion of your white money. So it's a non-starter. Then we come to the second stage that is, you know, uh, you need to do your real estate development and then again, uh, there's no kind of control on what kind of cost you are incurring mm -hmm. to do a project. And the third and the last challenge, when you're going out to sell that project, again, there is a difference between the DC rate and the market price. Mm -hmm. right? So the recent uh, amnesty that has been announced, the package that has been announced by the prime minister, takes away all three of these challenges. The government is simply going to come on the completion of the project and they're going to tax you at a certain fixed rate if you get your project registered before 31st of December. Due to COVID, I think uh, this, uh, this package should be extended for another six months. And real estate development <clears throat> remains the most preferred asset class today to me because you are operating in one of the lowest interest rate environments. So what has happened previously that, you know, people have entered into the real estate development, but those that the interest rates are also very high. So for a, a common man or a salaried person in, in a low salary bracket, buying a apartment or a house is next to impossible. 
you can only do that if you have a bank loan at a good decent price available and that is also part of the package that you know there are certain categories of 125 and 250 square yard houses where you get subsidized loans so these are all initiative those have never been seen before and hence i think uh, anybody into the real estate development today and who can actually manage to register uh, his drawings and his project before 31st of december it's the most exciting business because the tax incidents on under the new package is just negligible so you really, really you can make a windfall gain on this side now talking a bit about equities that's my favorite subject that's what i do for a living you know one has to look at the equities return in terms of comparing it uh, as as a last 15 year return by kc 100 index so anyone who has invested into kc 100 and i'm talking dollar terms now so i'll also cover the devaluation part of it that probably you know you're investing in pakistan and there's been so much devaluation and you're looking at a 15 year period i'm talking about a 15 year period your dollar based return has been into double digits this is just kind of you know amazing but mm-hmm. then you know it's it's a place uh, for patient investors so it's a long view it's a longer view because there can be volatility due to political uncertainty other factors you know international factors factors like covid which were like unheard of for the entire globe so i think one should not try and leverage and one should come up with safe investment in terms of investing into blue chips which is dividend yielding stocks companies with solid payout backgrounds for the last 10 20 30 years i think you can't go wrong there is so much so much value still left on the table at the stock exchange i think we are one of the most attractive markets in terms of price to earning in terms of dividend yields and in terms of price to book value when you compare to all the regional markets so, so there is the attractive for dollars from the institutional investors sitting overseas who are willing to take a frontier markets risk okay so uh, uh unfortunately uh, july uh, 2017 was a day uh, when we had moved from uh, msci frontier markets into emerging markets <clears throat> we were all very excited just to give you a little background so while pakistan uh, kc 100 was part of the uh, MSCI frontier markets our total weight uh, in the basket of the index was almost north of 9% at times we were close to 9.8% so there were a couple of like 18 20 billion dollars worth of money tracking us but you know we were a very relevant player right once we've shifted from the frontier markets into emerging markets there are trillions of dollars worth of funds under management tracking us but our weight went down to 0.14% as of that date when we had moved from frontier into emerging today with covid markets going down a little bit our weight at hardly 0.04% so what is oh, that right so i think it it that move we i think all the analysts at that point in time were thinking that you know with by also being a very small fish in a very large pound uh, pond we would be kind of attracting trillions of dollars following us but that wasn't the case today we have just kind of a tracking error in the emerging market and probably on a quarterly basis they would just come and kind of adjust the tracking error so we we are no more relevant for them that weight is not exciting for them so i think if you as for my candid view i'll say we were better off uh, uh, in the frontier markets and that's the reason i used the right word when i said we should be in the frontier markets <laughs> yeah i think if we go back to the frontier markets i think we'll be able to attract more money because you become relevant as an exchange you become relevant as an index and hence there is uh, there is more money coming towards pakistan in the last 5 years we have seen an outflow of almost north of 2 billion dollars so far from the equities market that's a big number yeah, does corporate governance play a big role in all of this to these institutional investors when they're looking to invest in a market like ours do they study the corporate governance structure laws around businesses does that make any difference there's a lot of talk around it which is why i ask so you know honestly i really have a view contrary to what this perception is a because i think uh, it's been very unfortunate that pakistani capital markets and especially the listed pace 
all the listed companies at the exchange has been very very compliant but we have been moving into a stream of over regulations so being a listed company uh, five years from here going back was really a challenge in itself there were so many requirements of corporate governance and there were so many requirements of staying listed at the exchange that it was turning into a burden i must give credit to the present regulator to the present regime that they have actually understood this entire challenge at very early stages and now we have moved in a direction where you know despite covid and all these challenges you have seen three listings at the stock exchange right three equity listings at the stock exchange we've done the first uh, pakistan energy scoop were 200 billion rupees through a big building process at the stock exchange which was never the case so i don't think there is uh, any lacking on part of corporate governance absolutely no even the foreign investors those who were invested in pakistan during the frontier times they had larger stakes in companies like ogdc and ppl so i don't think that corporate governance has ever been a challenge in terms of you know there were weaknesses i think actually there has been some good realization that we really need to kind of cut down over regulation because over regulation is also not healthy for the market people then don't they they're not keen to coming to the stock exchange they would rather want to stay in a in a private setup so i think uh, corporate governance is completely intact fully compliant and secp i think has done a fantastic job uh, in the last two years on many fronts so i don't actually think that you know there is uh, any any thinking on part of foreign investors it's just the fact that we have just become too small for the emerging funds to attract any any investor coming into this markets that's the problem good insight <laughs> now i'm just going to switch gears a little bit you're one of the, probably the youngest uh, chairman of the stock exchanges um you know what what was your secret sauce how did you pull this off for <laughs> let's say the budding analyst sitting at one of the you know shops out in karachi how do they pull this off ah so very interesting so it's it's been a very interesting situation for me uh while i was nominated on the board of the pakistan stock exchange as an independent director uh in uh, 2018 and uh, it's been just 3 4 months and we had a uh, casual vacancy and that was the vacancy of the chairman of the pakistan stock exchange unfortunately <clears throat> and uh, my only interaction with our chinese investors was on zoom and that is it so there was no personal interaction or there was no kind of a personal touch or anything into that i think uh, what they appreciated and the reason they nominated me was not only my understanding or knowledge of the capital markets but they could see my candor in that boardroom setup so i would not worry about the fact that you know who is who is suggesting what so my uh, comments and my recommendation would be for the institution and on merit so i think this was one thing that they were really found out that they would see me debating with a very senior member sitting on the board if i thought that you know this is the right thing to do so no offense to anybody i've learned a lot from this board it's been a great experience but to answer your question i think uh, being upright and upfront on sensitive matters without worrying about personalities so i think this is something they liked about me and uh, then they nominated me for this position so this is all i can say because it was just a 3 months interaction so all they wow. could see was uh, my conduct in the boardroom and that and this is this is very good feedback because what we find nowadays especially with the young grads what you know you find is very knowledgeable kids kids who know their stuff you know and and they have good assessments and analysis but they hold back maybe it's part of our bringing maybe we've been trained and taught not to speak up and respect the elders around the room and there are various things right but i think that there is merit to what you said and you know the way you deliver the message if you believe that you are right if you have the knowledge around it 
and the way you deliver that message to the audience you're delivering it to, I think it's important. People need to learn that they need to share knowledge. You know, holding it back then limits your career growth. But I'm assuming that along this journey, there must have been at least that one time when you just failed and you blew up and you're like, man, how do I get over this? I think there's what? been more than once. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you get past those moments? What, so what's I your think, secret sauce for that one? No, I think, uh, I think one thing that I had also kind of mentioned uh, on my day of elections, and of course that there's so much, so much uh, experience on both sides of the boardroom while me sitting in the center of the table. I said, uh, I don't have that kind of an experience, which is both, which is on both sides of the table. But I do have age on my side. I do have that energy to drive things. And I am greedy. I am thirsty to perform. I want to perform because my performance will also, at the stock exchange, will have a direct impact on my future, my career, my day job. So I can't afford to fail. I can't afford not to deliver, but I will be always leaning on you guys when it comes to any sensitive situation where, you know, the end, you know, there's no shortcut Fazan, to experience. There's, there's no shortcut to it, right? You only get it with uh, time. You only get it with age. So this has been my strategy that I've given respect to all the board members. All have been my seniors and it's been a great journey that I've always find found them very very supportive on any new idea on any difficult idea on any difficult subject and somehow god has been very kind that i've always enjoyed maximum support from the chinese directors as well as from the local directors and it's a board of 15 so you can well imagine you know it's it's it's, it's a it's a full time job in itself but uh, i think god has been very kind all my board members have been extremely supportive and that's the reason we are where we are today as an exchange. The markets have done very well. We've got the state of the art uh, trading and surveillance platform. I think since independence, uh, this has uh, been a struggle that, you know, we've been working on a totally locally made uh, technology platform. Uh, I, I love to promote local producers, but when it comes to technology, uh, the trading engine that we have acquired and the surveillance system from the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, I think that speaks volume. And this will, inshallah, in future also help rope in a lot of Chinese investments because their comfort is so much with their own trading engine and that has the capacity to deliver millions of trades in nanoseconds. So I think this is one, one big achievement uh, for the board of the Pakistan Stock Exchange. There have been a lot of work that we have done around many things. You know, ETFs have been introduced. Circuit breakers have gone up as per international standards. Minimum brokerage commission structure has been introduced and so on. And it's a long list. But I think getting the trading platform from Shenzhen Stock Exchange was the landmark achievement. You remind <clears throat> me of Wall Street and Gordon Gecko's character and the phrase, greed is good. Would you... Last question, would you pick the same career path for your kids, a life in the capital markets associated with the capital markets? Okay, so uh, very interesting. I've got two boys, uh, 14 and seven. The elder one wants to become a soccer player and we've been <laughs> taking him around the world wherever we find an opportunity before the COVID. So we've taken I am him a soccer to... team. Oh yeah, so he wants to become <laughs> a soccer player uh, the younger one is too small, but I think the way he keeps on paintings at home, I think he wants to become an artist. So I would actually not force them. I would rather promote them to go for their passion because once you go for your passion, I think you rock in whatever mm -hmm. field you kind of select for yourself. But if, if any one of them would like to kind of enter this industry, absolutely yes. I would love to kind of, you know, coach them, guide them. That's something, you know, will come naturally from me. But as said, there's no compulsion. I would really support them to pursue their passion in life. Very cool. Very cool. That's great advice. I think, um, you know, to sum it up, follow your passion 
invest in real estate development at this point in time and go long on Pakistan. I think that's my takeaway from uh, from our discussion. Suleiman really, really enjoyed the conversation, picked up some great insights. I'm going to make my little notes and go start investing immediately on exactly what you recommended. So thanks for taking the time out. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you all for tuning into episode 23. Stay tuned for the last episode next week. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.